Welcome back. The topic for panel eight is future force capability, capacity, and soft core activities. The moderator for this panel is Master Chief Petty Officer Brad Rhinelander, PhD, from Joint Special Operations University. Providing their perspectives on the topic are a distinguished panel of experts, including Mr. Charlie Black, Dr. Lillian Doc Alessa, and Dr. Dave Ellis, all uh, from the Joint Special Operations University faculty. Uh, Master Chief Petty Officer Rhinelander, Brad, has a distinguished uh, military career, uh, most notably in U.S. Special Operations Command. He has uh, attended both the U.S. Army and the Navy's Senior Enlisted Sergeant and Sergeant Majors Academy. But most importantly, I'd like to read to you what his Ph.D. dissertation topic was. His doctoral research, Special Operations Forces Culture and Implications for Interagency Collaboration, examined the Special Operations Forces and Department of State cultures in the context of collaboration in East Africa. Not only is Brad uh, a reputable moderator for this panel, but I think he would also be an excellent panelist. Brad, the floor is yours. Thank you for those remarks, Jim Howard. Uh, I think uh, probably not as good of a panelist as, uh, as, the, as the panelists we do have, considering that most of them in some degree or another have been uh, mentors of mine, uh, including Doc Alyssa as of late. Uh, our first panelist, uh, Dr. Dave Ellis, has certainly uh, been a mentor to me during my time at JSAL. Um, I routinely find myself making a trip to his office, uh, either to just fine tune my own thoughts, figure out how we can communicate topics within the uh, kind of corporate military culture, or, or simply commiserate about the mind numbing ways we find to, to get in our own way. Uh, he's a re resident senior fellow at JSAL. Uh, he holds a doctorate in international relations and comparative politics from the University of Florida. Uh, and he comes to us with a, comes to JSAL with a strong soft background, uh, both from the US SOCOM J2 and a deployment to Afghanistan from 2010 to 2011. Uh, his research focuses on the intersection of complexity, organizational learning within the special operations community and integrated campaigning. So without further ado, Dr. Ellis. And Brad, uh, we're, we're going to be uh, a poor institution without you in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, thank you for everything you've done for us here at, at JSO. And thank you, everyone, uh, for attending and, and listening uh, in today. What I'd like to start off with is uh, uh, a topic on how do we think about special operations um, not necessarily in the context of the 12 core activities and what that might mean for how we organize uh, for the future operating environment. Um, I, we conducted a or facilitated a core activities assessment a couple of months ago. And so uh, what I'm going to speak to today is just some of the insights that the working group had um, from that exercise. One of the first questions, though, is why do we have the, the 12 core activities? Why did they become um, our anchor point? Uh, it goes back to obviously um, why we have Goldwater Nichols and, and uh, mission failure. Um, and at that time, the main um, folks I were uh, lack of joint integration, uh, lack of proponents for specialized equipment, and a lack of joint uh, soft concepts or doctrine. So each service had its uh, own components with specialized capabilities and competencies, which were deemed important. And then as a consequence of Goldwater Nichols, uh, they focused on what they did, not necessarily how to make them more strategically effective, right? So the assumption was already that these are strategically effective and therefore we're just going to codify them in law. Um, now with a USOCOM as a proponent, um, as a service-like entity, and then also potentially as a combatant command uh, format or structure. Uh, as we enter in a new era of strategic competition, um, it's probably time to take a step back and engage in a Tom Surlian uh, kind of view of what is a special operation. And, and I would say that um, really, as we imagine that, it's relative to what the conventional forces are, are primarily going to be engaged in. Uh, first, and most importantly, in strategic competition, and then secondly, in vi countering violent extremism or dealing with that um, ongoing issue. So if we um, are looking at it from um, Searle's theory of special operations, it's really about uh, what are the conventional forces going to be organized to do? And then those things left outside of that framework are, are special operations. 
uh, and that will change in the future operating environment. So what won't the conventional forces uh, focus on in the future operating environment? Well, conventional forces are lar largely going to be focused in on um, a higher end deterrence uh, component um, based on a state to state level interaction. Uh, this we've already heard quite a bit about uh, in the last day and a half. Uh, the other component is potentially compellence through the use of force to try to change the status quo, whereas deterrence is about maintaining the status quo in the face of uh, adversary capabilities. If um, the conventional forces are aligned this way, then they're going to have a very necessary, expensive, um, and potentially uh, difficult challenge uh, in the near peer environment uh, with respect to high end competition, and that's going to leave some gaps in general. So, this is going to be a necessary component, but not necessarily sufficient for achieving as the joint concept for integrated campaigning by the joint staff wants us to seize the initiative. So, where are SOF likely going to play in the absence of con conventional forces? Uh, we'd like to focus, or uh, where the working group wound up uh, focusing, is on what are the roles that SOF are likely to play in the future operating environment. Uh, whereas the conventional forces are gonna be focused largely on hard power and deterrence, uh, there is a necessary soft power and soft balancing component that would likely fall uh, to SOF as part of a larger shaping capability. Um, and this is really about the political environment uh, and holding adversary interests at risk. There's obviously a military capability that goes along with that, but it really is on the periphery of um, adding complexity to the adversary strategy plans to frustrate them and to create options for us as we move forward in the operating environment. Uh, this is important because the joint concept for integrated campaigning overtly states in competition below armed conflict, uh, the, the best way to achieve um, effects over time is to compete uh, for advantage. That means national accrue national power and degrade the adversary's national power, which is intrinsically based on what their own uh, vulnerabilities are. So uh, if we take this as a foundation, then the question becomes, what are SOS value propositions within that future operating environment? Um, and this is where the idea of the core activities was uh, a foundation of specialties, competencies, but not necessarily the same effects. Uh, could you please uh, put up the graphic I had sent earlier? Thank you very much. So the framing of uh, the working group was that there were five basic strategic effects. And in this particular framing, uh, we have it from um, uh, national to subnational and kinetic to non-kinetic. There are other ways that we could depict this. This is just one way to think about it. Uh, advance, please. So the five effects, uh, I'll go through one by one. And the first one that emerged was the idea of strategic influence and information uh, op operations. And this is probably the most important in the competition below armed conflict because it, it runs across all the other things we do, right? The JICIC says, that we have to put strategic communications at the center of everything we do because everything is going to be politically oriented in competition below armed conflict. So um, this is where SOF are going to have obvious plays because we work across that spectrum of national to subnational and we have intrinsic information uh, capabilities. So if the um, information effect is so important, then SOF are really going to have an important play in that based on who we touch. The second is the idea of strategic shaping, which has probably a more national level orientation, but still requires engagement at the lower levels. Um, if we get the first one right, we're gonna be much more successful or capable in seizing the initiative as the JICIC requires of us and um, shape the environment, uh, seize the initiative. And I think this is what Dr. Weber was referring to yesterday in terms of providing an alternative, not just countering, but providing alternative of how to um, uh, gain uh, legitimacy, as Dr. Dudas was talking about. So this could have a number of mission areas, such as strategic reconnaissance, trying to figure out what is going on in the operating environment, who, what, are the, what is the adversary trying to do, to bolstering social resilience um, in the face of a threat, be it from a strategic competitor or, or, or perhaps a violent extremist organization. 
in the end, what um, this one is about is attacking the adversary strategy, not just its military capability. And I think that's kind of an important uh, framing of soft of, soft of um, value proposition in the future operating environment. The one I think is probably going to be the substance of a lot of the activity is this idea of support to resilience. Uh, this is where uh, we're looking at social political vulnerabilities within a population that, um, if not addressed, could lead to an eroding U.S. strategic position over time. Uh, it's another way of thinking also that the adversary has to go out and shape its own environment for its own strategic advantage and what are ways to frustrate um, those strategies. And this is where Bob Jones was metaphorically talking about energy yesterday. So how do you redirect energy, not dissipate it necessarily, but redirect it in ways that are more favorable to accruing U.S. national power? Um, and I think this is also where Dr. Dudas was talking about legitimacy yesterday. If we accept that a lot of the social resilience factors are going to be rooted in what is a ground up perception of legitimate behavior or action, um, there might be uh, components that SOF would support on this. Now, the JIC does mention that the majority of what SOF is going to handle is going to be support to interagency, support to the GMC. Um, and so it's, I think, and critical to remember that um, that's a major factor. But that also means we have to do something other than counter. So the counterculture is not going to be effective in a resilience framework. We have to think in terms of nurture network for strategic purpose building networks precisely because they create a more resilient population. A lot of the skills would be the same, but the application would be quite different, and so would the intelligence. Um, the, last, the fourth area was support to resistance, uh, whereas resilience is designed to inoculate a population, resistance is designed to deal with a population that's been overrun and provide the opportunity for liberating uh, that territory um, over time. Uh, there's also a deterrence component to this as a con contribution of an adversary's risk reward or cost benefit analysis. Um, obviously it would not necessarily deter a strategic competitor on its own, but it could add that uh, extra little value. And then the final component was this idea of countering global threats. Um, and this is not our typical CT fight from the last 15 to 20 years. This is the high end elite uh, capabilities for which SOF was um, really organized. Whereas the CT fight of the last 15 years has been much more advanced conventional, uh, this uh, working group thought of returning it back to uh, the more traditional high-end capabilities, elite capabilities of, of hostage rescue and recovery and CWMD and so on and so forth. Uh, the idea was not that these would displace the competencies and specialties of the core activities, but it was more of a recipe approach. What is the effect we're trying to achieve in a given environment and a given um, adversary? And then how do those core competencies or core activities wind up contributing as a, a pinch of soft here or there that make a strategic difference over time? Uh, so let me stop there and pass it over to um, Master Chief Petty Officer, Dr. Rhinelander. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate the remarks as always. Our next speaker will, will discuss the utility of soft and complex adaptive systems. Dr. Lillian Doc Alessa uh, is currently the chief scientist with J J the Joint Special Operations University and provides Arctic expertise to the DOD. Additionally, she serves on numerous advisory and leadership capacities with it, both within the United States government, uh, DOD and DHS, as well as uh, within academia. Uh, she has over 25 years of experience working with academic, federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial partners across Canada and the US. And her research is focused on national security, defense, and the res resilience of systems, people, and communities. I have particular affinity for Doc's focus on the operator, that is the human, which I think remains SOF's key contribution to increasingly technology-dominated conversations. Uh, some of that was picked up in the last panel on strategic culture. Uh, there's certainly days around US SOCOM where you'd think that the SO in US SOCOM stands for shiny object, but it is, in fact, not the US shiny object command. Uh, so without further ado, I will, I will uh, turn it over to Doc Alessa to speak to us about SOF and complex adaptive systems. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rhinelander. So I'm going to pick up three, three threads. The first one uh, came from Dr. Ellis. We're also going to talk about a framework that refers to compound security threats, which is essentially the world we live in now. And then we're going to come back to the first truth. So I challenge many of you to ask yourselves if you remember why the first truth is so powerful in US SOCOM, humans are more important than hardware. That's especially 
adaptable to the compound security threats that our world now is. So we're going to go through a couple of terms. So Dr. Ellis talked about complexity and complexity and complicatedness are two different things. Complexity refers to the ability of small changes or ubiquitous small uh, changes in a system to result in big effects. So when it comes to complexity, small wins over big every time. And as Dr. Ellis referred to the conventional approach that we've used for so very long, the wars of the past are no longer the kind of world that we live in right now or that the challenges we face and exist. So the other thread I'm gonna pull on is this idea of complicatedness and polycentrism. So in compound security threats, in the complex system that is the world we live in, that refers to the fact that our adversaries uh, work in all aspects of our lives, whether that be in our daily life, in marketing, whether it be in academia, in knowledge acquisition, or whether it be in direct behaviors that are um, provocative. The idea of adding complexity to their strategies or to their plans is, is very, very critical. In the first slide, which we're gonna pull up right now, you'll see that there are a number of areas and venues that are at play. All of these areas, all of these dynamics sit in a biophysical system, which is also changing. That is the complexity, the idea that small effects scale up to have a very large effect that we may not be aware of. So that is the surprise element. Complicatedness is the idea that there are many things, but they are mechanical and they move. And the complicatedness really refers to the technological aspects of the world. Those are actually relatively simple compared to the complexity of the compound security threats that we face. Polycentrism is essentially what US SOCOM was built to do. That means that to address the compound security threats, that complex system in which we now exist, we need the polycentrism of the special operations community. Why? The way we train and the way we work, the way we operate and the way we leverage the human capital is very, very different than conventional services. The human is essentially the key ingredient to addressing and meeting the complexity of our adversaries' actions. Technology will not do it. So there are two types of technology. There's binary technology and polycentric technology. Binary technology is the one you hear about all the time when you hear about the successes, for example, AI or machine learning, artificial intelligence or machine learning. Those are binary technologies. So they're most often in sensors, in um, uh, essentially what we call checkmate technologies. So they're their binary motions, for example, in dog fights or in being able to anticipate a um, medical outcome for an individual or a patient. Those technologies are great. They're very important. They augment our decision-making, but polycentric technologies actually cannot function without humans at the core. The reason is the humans determine what the rule sets are for those technologies to operate which brings us to the next slide in our complex system. The way we design technologies comes essentially from the nation's knowledge base, <clears throat> excuse me, which is essentially academia. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So that scientific realm of how we develop uh, technologies, and we'll actually jump to the next one, thank you. It, the, the way we develop technologies is uh, key. We do it by a set of requirements, and those requirements are based on what we perceive the needs are in the world. Here's the interesting chicken and egg problem we have with our conventional forces, and where SOCOM is a key if we remember the first truth. The chicken and egg problem is that we design requirements based on what we perceive or determined to be the challenge at play. 
those requirements are then put into research. That research is turned into technology. That technology comes back and is given to the operator in the field. Could we go to the next slide, please? The way that technologies function in theory and in controlled environments and the way they operate and the way they function when the operator has them in the field are very, very different. So in that space, in that nexus of the theory and the practice is where SOCOM lies because the dynamics and the diversity of the applications in the soft world is very unique across all the services, as well as in soft support to the interagency across the Gen C. Could we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so we just spoke to this slide. Um, that tip of the spear, that operational side, refers to that polycentrism. No other, no other service, no other organization has that diversity of roles, as well as the diversity of skill sets that we need to address the CST, the compound security threat, the complex system that the world now is. So historically, where you had what was essentially a binary or trinary system, we now have this polycentric uh, uh, threat system, as well as opportunity space. And in that opportunity space, you need a different form of technology. The technology that has the human as part of the quantum and digital combination. Next slide, please. So technologies are essentially tools. And what we've done recently is we've seen them as solutions and that will be our undoing. That is a fatal assumption to see a technology as a solution. The solution comes from the ability of a human trained properly to be able to understand, encapsulate, articulate, and then establish a set of rules on which technology operates. One of my areas of expertise is in the artificial intelligence machine learning for intelligence operations, as well as for ground operations, when you have high uncertainty. So what this slide refers to is the range of possible futures that could occur in a given scenario. So if you think about a board game, you think about any kind of forecasting for the future, you realize that there are many potential futures and we need to be able to determine which future is the most likely one that we will be dealing with. In order to do that, we require machine augmentation, but we, we require first the most precise set of rules. Those rules cannot be derived through technology because technology does not give us context. No social network analysis, no data mining, nothing gives us context outside of the ability of a human to be in situ. The quantum machine that is brain has not been replicated, nor is it to be replicated soon. The combination of that quantum machine with machine augmentation is powerful. If the quantum part of that equation of the machine augmentation is incorrect, then the chances are you will land on an imprecise or unlikely future. The role of perception, the role of constructs, the role of social systems in a biophysical setting is something that SOCOM excels in. To be able to get the pulse, the pulse, the most accurate pulse of what the compound security threat landscape looks like is only able to be achieved by the soft community because of that polycentric distribution of its skills, its personnel, its ability, and the way we train. Last slide, please. Okay, so moving on to the point that I'd like to make is that when we do a failures analysis, and we have done extensive research in this kind of analysis, why did something fail? Why did an operation fail? Why did the water 
um, a water uh, station go down? Why didn't a technology that we deployed to a partner, an ally, or a nation, why didn't it work? What happened? What went wrong? Uh, last slide, please. What always comes, what it always comes back to is the fact that there was a human element that was not anticipated. So that human element has to do with the niche, the niche that humans play in an environment, in a complex system. The power of putting the human first in that hybrid human technology system allows us to determine not only the types of actors we're working with, the dilemmas that they exist in, the biophysical changes that they are most likely to respond to, as well as the kind of decision tools that they have at their disposal. Last slide, please. The types of agents in all these systems, in complex systems, matters. The only way we are able to address these complex systems is by going back, returning to the first truth not abandoning technology in any way, shape, or form, but putting the human first. Our requirements need to improve. We need to have better cohesion across our efforts, operating as an organism so that we can leverage all the different types of human assets across the enterprise will be key to gaining the strategic advantage in a complex and changing dynamic world. I'll leave it there and turn it over. Thank you, Doc. Uh, great comments as always, and I'm certainly looking forward to the Q&A with you. Our final panelist is uh, Mr. Charlie Black, another person I'm proud to have as a mentor and colleague. Uh, he's often uh, right by Dr. Ellis' side on many of my trips to uh, his office to commiserate. Um, and, and, and at times when I'm wondering if I'm on a, a hidden camera reality show with some of the goings on. Uh, Charlie Black is a non-resident fellow at JSAO focused on te teaching research. He's also a retired Marine Corps officer with 30 years of experience spanning diverse political and military roles and experiences. He's also a professional member of the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory where he lends his expertise to national priority projects. Charlie's gonna speak with us about how do we reconceptualize force structure implications for education and force generation. This is another topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, as our kind of corporate enterprise structure at SOCOM has grown, that often as it does comes with, uh, it, you know, increased administrative burdens. And, uh, you know, I'm always fond of acknowledging that our, our military hierarchy charts give somebody the uh, kind of uh, failed impression that requirements will distribute down at the lower levels, but each individual at the lower level is obviously feeling the totality of requirements uh, generated at that often uh, very wide waistline of the organization. Um, so, you Going back to the soft truths, we all know that soft cannot be mass produced. So coming right off the of Doc Alessa's talk on the humans, uh, I'll turn it over to Charlie to talk about how we reconceptualize force structure and the implications for education force generation. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Brad. Um, I wanna thank you uh, for your comments. Um, I, I think equally you've been a mentor of mine as well as uh, um, others on the faculty. So I'm, I'm very thankful to have the opportunity to be on the faculty and then to offer some thoughts here today. I certainly will share, uh, my intentions are to share a different perspective for both scholars who have attended, but more importantly for the practitioners in the soft enterprise to think about strategic competition differently, um, as well as ultimately then acting in a complex system that Dr. Alessa spoke about to achieve the right effects um, in strategic competition. So I, I need to talk about that a little bit before I get to force design and force generation, which is really my focus. So first I'd like to offer an alternative sort of framing or definition of strategic competition that builds on some of the comments from yesterday. Um, so I, I see it um, as a series of multivariable games and there's both infinity, infinite and finite games within there. And I think uh, um, Chief Warrant Officer Duclos talked about that a little bit yesterday, but I see it where um, in which the players are, and the audience and the game officials and the benefactors and the advertisers of this game, um, the game board itself, the rules, and then the framing of what we think winning and losing is are all dependent on the respective interpretations of that by all of the players. So what does that mean? Um, what that means is it's very complex as, as just described by Dr. Alessa. 
Some would say, ah, oh, Charlie, your definition is too cumbersome, it's too difficult. Um, I don't wanna reduce complexity to simplicity. Um, complexity is irreducible, it is unpredictable, it is amb amb ambiguous. And that's important as we transition into thinking about um, force design, force generation, and then ultimately how we're gonna behave in this complex environment to do the things that we're often asked to do. Um, I think these forums um, focus on theory and history um, a lot of times, which I think is very important. Both theory and history, if done properly, can illuminate a path forward. Um, I would caution, um, there was an article in the early 80s written by a gentleman named Michael Howard on the use and misuse of military history, and he talked about myth-making. And there's a tendency, particularly with those who are successful, to have heroic views of the past. Um, I think those often become anchors to change. Um, because we were successful in the last 20 years or the last 30 years or in a particular battle does not mean that those that will be successful tomorrow and that we should often, we should always uh, question the efficacy of what we're doing, um, our own thinking, et cetera. So that's gonna lead me to, um, you know, so what's all this have to do with force design? It has everything to do with force design. Um, but before I get into that, um, you know, if we follow on Doc uh, Alessa's comments and then what uh, Dr. Ellis said, and I think perhaps many of the other expert panelists that have been phenomenal, um, whether you agree on the specific definition of strategic or uh, uh, strategic competition, I think we would agree that there are many interests in the world. There's many opportunities that are emergent from those dynamic conditions. So if that's true, how do we how do we design a force that can do lots of things, some of which we're not really exactly sure what those things are going to be? Um, it's a little easier for the conventional forces, um, a little bit more difficult for special operations. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But first, um, there was a recent congressional research um, study done on force design, and, and I think it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, you know, the U.S. military is the only one that, is, that has designed a military that can depart one hemisphere, travel across vast oceans and airspace, and now cyberspace, um, and then conduct sustained large-scale military operations in another hemisphere. Um, so what does that say? That said, if, if we know what the specific threat is, that's great. But what if there are multiple threats? And, and Dr. Wilson and then Dr. Alessa just spoke to compound security. It's not so easy when we're talking about less than war. And soft's role is not just to contribute to conflict or preparation for conflict. There's now this emergent new role within strategic competition as it's framed today. And there's an increasing uh, demand signal for that. So, so as we talk about force design, I think there's, there's three things um, within soft's role um, inherently, organically that, that, that emerges from soft today. Um, one, special operations forces, if the right ones are chosen, can extend the reach of military power um, into areas that would normally be considered no-go areas. Um, and I think uh, Chief Duclos talked yesterday about denied areas. He talked about it ethnically, linguistically, you know, gave a whole bunch of re you know, layers of an onion. I agree with that. Um, special operations forces through using their through partnerships, old ones and new ones, and those yet to be established, can extend military power to all parts of the globe. Um, at a time and place of our choosing. We have that capability. Special operations forces limit political risk as compared to conventional forces because we have the ability to manage attribution, often at a time and time and place of our choosing. Um, it's not to say that it's clandestine, covert, maybe, um, but at some point um, we we can we can we can manage this calculus of attribution of our actions because of the small footprint with the political risk if that were to be discovered. And then third, um, clearly, which goes to our history uh, collectively, is the ability to operate at the sub-sovereign level. Um, sure, we can partner with state militaries or state entities, but we're equally and perhaps better uh, positioned to operate among population groups, indigenous um, uh, forces, and to achieve effects below the state level. Um, and as we move to the for future, dealing with the uh, strategic competition as Dr. Ellis alluded to in his framing, we're gonna have to do that more and more with our GMC partners. 
less and less of doing that unilaterally as U.S. SOF or multinational SOF. We're also going to have to do that with the interagency, internationally, corporate, and then non-traditional partners. We have any unorthodox partners we haven't even thought about. Um, and Brad and I have talked about some of these when it comes to ecological and some other areas. So, um, so let me transition to, so if all this were to be true, um, SOCOM's role under Title 10, responsibilities for you know the commander under Section 164 and 167 likely aren't going to change. But how that manifests on the ground, um, I, I think does change because the world's changing. And so we have to keep pace with that change. Um, so complexity emergence demands from a force design perspective. Um, first, I'll, I'll give you sort of five criteria, and then I'm going to tell you, do I think we, we exemplify that? First is organizational agility. Um, an organization has to be able to shift at echelon um, between major tasks or roles. Um, I would offer that at the tactical level, special operations forces have always done this, do it now and we'll do it tomorrow. Uh, conversely, I would say that at, at echelon, the higher we reach in the chain of command away from the CO operator or the Green Beret or the Psy upper, that we're less organizationally agile. Um, I mean, look how long it's taken us to shift to great power competition um, from when the NDS was published and where we are today. We're not an aircraft carrier. We're not the big services. Special Operations Forces should be able to do, you know, I'm a naval officer, so a destroyer turn. We should be able to turn pretty quickly. So I'm going to oversimplify that. So second is versatility. And this is where I think I will diverge from many's opinions in the soft enterprise. This is about diversity of capabilities within the soft enterprise. The, the more complex the world is and the more interests that are at play and the more opportunities and threats that emerge from complexity, short of war, the more diverse our capabilities need to be as special operations forces. And we have that. We've had that prior to 9-11. Unfortunately, some of that has been normalized and we've generalized some of our special operations forces because we treat them as interchangeable rather than interoperable. And there's a difference. So we have to be very cautious not to assume that special operations forces are fungible. A SEAL is not a Marine Raider, is not a Green Beret. They share some very common, but they also have, they, they aggregate and they produce different capabilities for different reasons. Um, and we should recognize those differences are the strength of the special operations enterprise. But because of the high demand, we tend to treat them as interchangeable. And I think that's a very dangerous road. And I think we've, we, we've learned from that, I hope, um, but I'm not really certain. We'll see how that plays out. Third is force modularity. So I'm gonna use a simple analogy here. Um, think of the service components are generating, producing uh, highly qualified special operations forces. Each of them are like a Lego. Some are a two, a two piece Lego, some are a four piece Lego, some are green, some are brown, some are red. Um, today, each of the services produce a specific kind of Lego. What we have to be able to do in the future from a force design perspective is to build Legos that actually the red, the blue, and the purple Lego have to be able to connect at the very tactical level and operate. Um, so this, you're gonna take versatile or different capabilities, you're gonna aggregate them in a very quick manner, um, but this can't be an ad hoc. So if we tie back to you know the, the CR that Brad participated in, this can't be an ad hoc by chance consequence. This has to be purposely designed this way. That's not the case today. Today, USASOC produces a range of capabilities that are service soft capabilities, the SEAL, you know, NSW, MARSOC, et cetera. But do we train, organize, and equip individual operators that are by design not to deploy as a SEAL platoon or in an ODA, but also able to equally um, be task organized into a cohesive team and deployed as a cohesive entity at a very small level? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I have some opinions. Fourth, multi-domain awareness and effects, which ties a little bit into what Dr. Alessa just said. Because the world is extremely complex, and because the operator at the pointy end of the spear is the most important resource we have, 
How do we help he or she at the pointy end have the awareness of emergent conditions so that they can make the best decisions to accomplish the mission? So this is a little bit, you know, uh, this is not the way we are operate today. There's an awful lot of tactical operators producing 80 PowerPoint slides to brief some higher headquarters. It should, why isn't it the other way around? The information should be being pushed down, enabling the pointy end. The farther you get down in the food chain, the more they should be being enabled from the higher echelon, not the other way around. This does not in any way undermine command and control. There's actually you know, inherent functions of command and control. Um, and if it's trust tactics is, is the way that we're operating, which I hope that is the case, um, then, then this should follow. So that leads into my fifth, which is distributed mission command. Um, I would offer that, that US SOCOM in general does a poor job at mission command. Um, and there'll be a lot of people who will be upset by me saying that um, and uh, as compared to the individual operators. Mission command is not a, is, is, has sub functions. There's what is the actual operational requirement? What is the risk? Now we're talking about a complex environment where there's multiple stakeholders across the globe, across domains that have interests in that activity and would incur risk if it were to be discovered or the effects of that would have effects. So how do we manage that multivariable risk? Then there's the actual mission itself, which is the easier one. And, we're, and then there's the enabler and the integration piece. Um, so those are four subsects, four sub elements of mission command. Um, and that can be distributed by design. Today, that's not how we do it. We deploy a headquarters that in theory, we think are gonna do all of those functions. In a complex uh, strategic competition space, I'm not sure that that's necessary and technology can help us communicate. And perhaps some of those functions can be done in, in dispersed ways, either to reduce the risk from compromise from the adversary, um, to provide resiliency from attack, um, to manage the well, et cetera. So, so those are five concepts or, 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 or ideas related to force design. So that follows next into force generation. So if we go back to my definition that uh, strategic competition is a multivariable game, um, strategic or force generation is about identifying what is the right game? What game are we playing? I have to build the right team with the right positions and the right players, ensure that they're trained, organized, and equipped and ready, and then deploy them with the appropriate mission command. I would offer we don't do that well today. Today, what we do is we get a requirement and we either turn to one of the components and then they generate the answer. Um, but it's interesting, the answer, they're not interchangeable. And sometimes you need some NSW capability with some RSOF capability, with some AFSOC capability, and I know all those, wow, well, we do that, we have Gisotis, we have this, we have that. Um, just calling something joint doesn't make it so. Um, taking a service headquarters and adding one person from another service doesn't make it joint. So I, I would offer we're not doing that well. Um, we need to move towards tailored forces, You know, the right capability with the right capacity, with the right mission. Um, and we have to be able to generate that in, in a time scale that keeps pace with change with the emergent opportunities in the, in the competition space. If we don't do that, um, we're, we're gonna fail. We need to deploy for purpose, not rotation. Meaning we've gotten accustomed to over the last you know, 20 plus years in war that, okay, Brad's gonna re Brad's platoon's gonna do a workup, they're gonna deploy for six months and they're gonna come home. Um, and there's a lot of hidden assumptions in there that one, when I'm home, I'm safe, not true. There is no sanctuary anymore in the competition space. Everything you're doing can be observed and is gonna be interpreted by the adversary and others. Um, two, deploying just to deploy doesn't make a lot of sense. If you can deploy for 10 days to accomplish and achieve the effect that you need to, then you should do that. Why would you go for six months? Um, so this is interdependent on readiness. So deploying for purpose, not on a rotational basis, just because that makes it easier for higher headquarters is not the answer. Uh, third and fourth generation, um, which ties to this readiness and rotational thing is, is the notion of, um, there are many who would say we need persistent presence. Um, I don't know that I agree with that. Um, we need persistent relationships. Um, you don't necessarily need, COVID is proven, you don't need to be personally connected to someone for six months, 365 days a year to mature and advance a relationship. So tying with the deploy for purpose, using technology, we should keep global reach. Special operations forces should be able to 
extend military power to anywhere on the globe by through and with um, at a time and place that's necessary. But putting our own little green men behind every bush is not the answer. Um, we're not going to get any more soft. There's not enough to do that. Um, and you're misusing them. Um, so, so in the end, I, I'm going to move towards closing here. In the end, and Dr. Alessa focused on this, the operators are the most, humans are the most important resource that we have. And it's not just for SOF, it's for the U.S. military in general. Um, and I think we've lost sight of that sometimes, um, but we need equally capable mission command. To me, I still think that it's an ad hoc. Um, it's, it's not anywhere near as, as robust as our assessment, selecting, and training of our operators. We should see mission command as an equally uh, balanced to that. So we should empower and inform. If we assess and select individuals like Brad Rylander or others, um, and then we give them special training, then we should trust them to solve problems and exploit opportunities at the pointy edge of the empire, um, on, the, on, the, on the periphery of complexity. Um, to do that, he has to have multi-domain awareness. He has to have force modularity. He has to have versatility. The organization has to be agile. So, so we have to change some of the design. We should be supporting the lowest level of the soft enterprise. The top should be supporting the bottom, not the other way around. We need to turn the triangle upside down. Second, reframe and reimagine command and control. The broader joint force is doing this. I mean, the, the joint force is moving towards a joint all domain command and control. Soft is not going to be excluded from that. You, you, we need to figure out how we're going to be part of that and distributed mission command and all domain. We're not, uh, we're good at achieving multi domain effects. We're not really good at multi domain command and control and integrating. Um, at echelon, and, and we, we need to improve that if, if we're going to be that force that's doing that. Third, and I think most important is what I would call conserve and cultivate. Conserve our limited capacity. We're not going to get more. Um, certainly, we might even have less if we actually diversify our capabilities because it's a zero-sum game, and we need to be very judicious in the employment of our precious resources at the right time, at the right place to achieve the right effect, um, deployed for purpose to do so. Um, and then last, um, and this ties into Dr. Ellis's points of cultivating, cultivating a Jim C mindset, you know, that sort of admixture uh, where we're just part of the recipe. Uh, so to do so, we have to change the way we think about force design and force generation. So I'll stop there, Brad. Sorry, I went over. Sorry, right, Charlie. I appreciate it. Good stuff as usual. Um, you know, I think it, it, listening to your comments, it just reminds me once again, there's it, it's. I can go down to the to the E5 O1 level at our SEAL platoons right now, and and the operators understand things a lot of the same way that, you know, listen to General McKinsey's posture statement, listen to General Clark talk, eye to eye, um, and then so much just gets lost in the translation and the organization, and I don't think we're always as good at, at harnessing that. Um, you know, we have we have folks I'm dealing with right now in deployed environments that are um, having a higher level headquarters tell them. Um, they're supposed to be doing CVEO, so they can't do GPC um, when literally there's, we just had two postures back to back with commanders saying, hey, there's, these things aren't mutually exclusive and those authorities are available. Uh, again, we can't, can't get in our way fast enough. And I think part of the issue seems to be sometimes we get stuck in these tropes, uh, particularly, you know, as people get more and more distant from the, from the contact layer and the operator level, um, these tropes with a couple of the negativity bias of all the negative news stories of what an operator is and don't realize the talent that exists in the, in the, in the force um, out at that level and, and the, the very intelligent capable operators that we're, that we're bringing in uh, for that purpose. I, I wouldn't select and assess Brad Rhinelander. Um, there's, there's much better, uh, much better seals coming in now. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's a good thing I'll be retiring sometime in the near future. Uh, we'll move on to some questions with some, uh, some time, we, time we have left. Uh, so uh, uh, earlier question, and Dave, I think this will primarily fall to you, but I'm sure the others will have some thoughts on it, uh, particularly as it deals to uh, complexity and, and having uh, some agile and adaptive responses. But is the U.S. allocating enough effort and resources to building partner nation, re nation resilience and resistance capabilities? Uh, resistance, probably. I, I'm not deep in that, but it's been a, a a concept that we've played with now for a couple of years. And so I think that's much more developed. I, my personal assessment is that the whole idea of resilience is something that is fresh ground needs to be developed. And while we do a lot of the behaviors, we have not, um, our doctrine still ties us to a state centric model of resilience. And that is a, a tremendous flaw. 
Um, we have to totally scrap that and begin again, in my opinion. That's just my opinion. Uh, but there is enough. Uh, there are enough concepts within social science, human centric or human security oriented kinds of concepts can get us down the line much faster and adapt what we do already for uh, what our resilience affects. I would say though that they're not going to have any real meaning unless we do what the JK implores, and that is to put the strategic communications component at the front of everything we do. And um, I can't stress enough that uh, that if we are going to march down this line, getting the knowledge and framing of why we're doing physical activities on the ground within a influence and information framework, we're not going to have any real effect. Thank you, Dave. I think you and I have had some conversations before about uh, you know, somewhat of the irony of the, some of the most successful uh, resistance campaigns that have occurred in history. Um, we did quite well um, just by engaging with the population, the, or, the organic folks on the ground, um, and with all of this doctrine we have. So I think it's, it ties definitely with what Doc Alyssa was speaking about, as well as Charlie. Uh, Doc or Charlie, do you have anything else you wanted to add to that before we move on to the next question? Just real fast, I think that the resilience aspect is where we're going to get the biggest bang for our bucks um, in the future. And, and that's something where uh, JSAO can really make a huge difference by understanding the components, those key indicators, uh, those key variables that if we put our effort into will give us a bigger return. That's going to be a, like you said, Brad, that's going to be a really, and, and Dave said as well, that's going to be a really important part for us to look at uh, here now and next. Thank you. And then for the panel, um, you know, where do you see SOCOM needing to break down stovepipes um, and, and kind of getting away from a, a orientation to countering, uh, particular emphasis on the realm of influence warfare, uh, where we need to combine soft and non-soft capabilities and how do we properly reframe the problems uh, to avoid just doing variations of what we've always done. So one of the uh, elements of, of research that we've been conducting over the last uh, year or two has been the relationship between a counter network mindset, uh, right? And which is kind of the heart of where we imagine ourselves in counterinsurgency, counter threat network, counter terrorism. We're countering, countering, countering. Um, and there's some recognition that that's not necessarily translating into strategic and enduring strategic effect, right? So we can have some tactical to operational success, but it doesn't endure. And why is that? Uh, the the part of the reason we're we're so enthusiastic about complexity theory as a foundation is because it helps explain that within any social system, it is a complex uh, adaptive system. Networks emerge from those higher end, higher order social systems. You can apply physical or kinetic activity to bust up components, but if it is a fundamentally resilient uh, system, the relationships will reform over time and you just create this whack-a-mole environment. In complex adaptive systems, the only way you're going to get to a sustainable strategic effect, new ways of things naturally occurring, is by creating new relationships and forcing new ways or interests of behaviors uh, over the long term. And all you have to do is look at what the CCP has done in sub-sovereign operations to create new pathways of interaction, both physically and virtually, create inducements uh, for trade and whatnot, and uh, they've, they've completely flummoxed us based on what we're calling now maybe nurture network. They've created opportunities for relationships to be formed and have outflanked us uh, without really ever shot, firing a shot. And I'll stop there. So, so also important is being able to understand again in the resilience uh, aspects and in any complex system because small, small actions have big effects is understanding which effects are going to give us what we want. So we're, we, we have a duality where we want an effect that gives us an advantage as well as our partners and allies and gives our adversary disadvantage. And so that's going to require us to be more, uh, there's three elements there, more precise in uh, the way we acquire information and understanding instead of just relying on you know, the same old uh, technological outputs all the time. They're not helping us as much as we thought they would. 
Number two, those stove, stove pipes that Charlie mentioned are absolutely critical. We have this, this odd thing where we've, we've descended into minutia in a lot of the J's. Uh, and then that doesn't give people enough time to look up and look across, or there's, they are disincentivized to do that. So there's a lower likelihood that they would do it anyhow. And then the third element is that we can do a better job um, looking forward, we keep we keep analyzing the past, so we're always in retro mode, but we need to look forward. And I don't mean a far future forward, I'm talking next week. So basically there's a, there's a Maori saying that we, we walk into the future looking behind us. And there's, there's a lot of pitfalls in that, there's a lot of utility in leveraging lessons learned but not always analyzing the past. We need to go forward, identify those indicators, use those indicators, and then get really quick returns to see what was successful so that our small, diverse, polycentric actions give us a really big effect um, in our favor. Thanks, Doc. It reminded me of one of the earlier panels, I think, you know, somewhat on this topic, right, is our, you know, how we synchronize priorities across across the government. Um, and then also kind of getting out of this, this mindset we've been in from the post-colonial inheritance that we had of, of, you know, having to engage the Soviets around the globe um, and and the reputational harm that our nation is has, hangover kind of has from that in many areas where, hey, sometimes we don't need to capture all customers and we need to be deliberate about the customers we want and we don't need to go head to head with China in every single country. Um, there may be benefits uh, to, to allowing them to, to own some of the problems as well. Um, final question, uh, and Charlie, I think this kind of falls to your topic, but uh, we'll open it up to everybody with the time we have left. Which are the soft educational areas or aspects that you identify j should have to include or, to, or increase in order to face the challenges you have addressed? Uh, what are the priorities uh, you see within these additional requirements? So, so the dovetail off the, the, the previous answer to the previous question, um, for us to be able to inoculate uh, population groups against um, adversaries, right? We're talking about this whole notion of resilience, way left of resistance. Um, we special operations forces at the, at the very tactical level have to be able to operate and integrate, not deconflict, integrate with our interagency brothers and sisters and others. And there are instances that we do that, but as a general norm, um, if your mission is there to shoot someone in the face, you're there doing that and someone else is feeding people. But like those two things are connected. They're all the United States government. Um, so with that, I think that we need to do a better job of um, explaining the nuance of statecraft to all of our operators, everybody in the soft enterprise, no matter if it's an operator or not, statecraft, um, understanding that. Um, if war is an extension of politics and we're not doing war, but we're employing military power. Do we really understand politics? I, I didn't until very late in my life because I ignored that, right? Uh, some political decision was made and I go execute. But if we're asking you and brand new special operators to be at the edge of complexity, to be able to exploit opportunities and solve problems, they need to be better educated on some of how the larger world works. They're intelligent enough to do that. And I think we need to go down that road. So I'll, I'll save a couple of time for everybody else. Thanks, Charlie. Dr. Alessa, Dr. Ellis? Yeah, yeah so, so I'm gonna jump in here in that sometimes the, uh, the present company excluded the words complexity, complex adaptive, uh, adaptive systems, and the kinds of frameworks that are necessary to ex really execute those for the operators um, are, are misunderstood or they're conflated. So I think that one of the ways JSAP can lead is to really lead in the areas of um, CAS, complex adaptive systems, set in a, in a CST, compound security threat environment, uh, for operators. That's something that, that we, we don't do a great job of just because the, the new world has emerged so, so drastically in our faces. And I feel fairly strongly about that because that's, a, that's an area of research and an area of practice that I do. So I may be a bit biased, but I've seen it in action and I have seen it succeed. Over to Dave. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up in, in a term called or a, a new body of research called evolutionary governance theory. 
And uh, rather than doctrine, which is state-centric, it really is focused in on complex adaptive systems as a foundation. It uh, discusses how the social construction of reality and the value of narrative or the purpose of narrative in creating what are called path dependencies, right? The, the near future is relatively knowable because human be behaviors repeat uh, in the near term, but they are eminently adaptable over time as Dacalus has been talking about. Uh, so if we think about how um, you intervene in complex social systems, it is rooted more in evolutionary governance. You can merge it or morph it over time doing immediate changes are, are really hard. That would be kind of a, a, a foundational perspective, I think, that would be valuable. The good news is JSAL has already got a lot of this in its curriculum. It's uh, just distributed and, and needs to be cohered for, for purpose. Uh, complexity, systems thinking, uh, design, right? abductive logic, and, and how you think about the future. All of those are already part of it. We also have content on governance at the local level um, thinking about infinite games, so on and so forth. Where we don't really have our uh, curriculum in line with it is on the social construction of reality and the politics of developing nations. This is going to be critical moving forward and going back to Charlie's point, if we're going to be successful in arming that operator downrange, um, to interpret what he or she is seeing, those I think are the other elements that need to be incorporated in the curriculum. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dave, for that, those great closing comments. Really appreciated your time today. Uh, a huge pleasure. I could sit and speak with you all this all afternoon. Um, so uh, I, I walk away with as many things to look up and as many questions as ever, and I look forward to working with you in the future. I sincerely appreciate our panelists' time this afternoon. Thank you. Well, thank you to an all JSAL panel for an excellent, excellent presentations. and. Dr. Rhinelander, thank you for uh, moderating the panel. We are going to miss you. <laughs>